Radio, all college band, all the time. Hi, and welcome to episode four, everybody. This is Hannah. I'm joined with Annabelle and Savannah. And we're going to go ahead and kick off this week's episode with some news from around the sports world. So Annabelle, why don't you tell us a little bit about what was going on at LSU this week? Yeah, the event actually happened last year during the LSU um, National Championship. So um, we all know OBJ, Odell Beckham Jr. Um, So there's a video, if you haven't seen it yet, after the game, he's going up to players and handing them money. Um, At first, I believe it was reported that it was fake money. And then people came to their senses and realized it was actual money. Um, The NCAA didn't file any charges with LSU, but LSU um, now has self-imposed penalties um, relating to the NCAA's investigation. And so those are, so the Tigers are not going to lose eight scholarships over the next two years, and they have to reduce their recruiting visits, evaluations, and communications. Along with that, um, Odell Beckham Jr. is now banned from their football facilities for the next two years. And then that's a level three violation. Um, so it turns out he gave them over $2,000 in cash. So it's not very good looking for LSU. I personally think it's interesting that they impose these penalties themselves versus the NCAA mm-hmm. can, coming down on them. They might have had a deal um, where it may have been less if they did it themselves. I think this is definitely going to hurt them. Eight scholarships is a lot. Um, I wonder, like, you know, in the future, I don't know if it's going to impact future scholarships or the ones they currently have on their roster. But I think that will definitely hurt their recruiting in the long term. I think term. something that really stands out to me about this is that, like, everybody saw him handing out money after the game. And was like, oh, it's fake money. And then it's like, why would he be handing out fake money? <laughs> and then for those that don't know, yeah, OBJ um, went to LSU. So yeah, he was he's alumni of that getting way. hyped for that national championship. I think it'll be interesting, <laughs> too, like you mentioned, to see how this affects recruiting. Because you'll have people who, even if they were originally committed for a scholarship and that scholarship no longer exists in the future, LSU is usually a national championship contender program uh, or a contender for a national championship, I should say. So it'll be interesting if people decide like, oh, hey, like it's still worth it. Like my name will be on the roster. I'll get to say I won a national championship. Or if they'll be like, yep, money is not there. I'm going elsewhere. I'm going to hedge my bets at a different school. So another big story we kind of discuss, we kind of saw come out this week was down at the University of Texas. So Savannah, can you do you want to talk a little bit more about that? So some news that has impacted the band world uh, more recently is the news about the University of Texas Longhorn Marching Band uh, saying they lack the necessary instrumentation to play their alma mater, The Eyes of Texas. Um, there has been some talk about this recently as it was a kind of a movement started by the student athletes at the University of Texas. Uh, to, mm-hmm. along with other demands um, for the university to take a stronger stance against racial injustice, one of those was to stop playing the eyes of Texas because it has racial undertones and racial history. You know, all these colleges have traditions and stuff, but there comes a point when tradition needs to be gotten rid of, especially in this situation, in my opinion. Some people who are saying, oh, well, it's tradition, we've always done it this way, but that doesn't mean that things can't change, you know? I'm glad that these band people are kind of standing up for what they believe in and deciding not to play it. But yeah, so that's an uh, unfolding situation. I think that's a really interesting thing that's come out. I think you're absolutely right with that. We're like, as uncomfortable as or weird as it is, as it may feel for people to be like, oh, well, this is tradition, we can't just change it. Like, we can and we should. And that's a big part of making like our college campuses and even the United States as a whole, a more welcoming and kind of inclusive place for everybody. And we saw something similar happen earlier this year, actually, where, as you guys might remember, is the Georgia Redcoat Band often played Tara's theme from Gone with the Wind. And they decided to stop playing that as a band because they were like, you know, the movie Gone with the Wind, like while it's an example of kind of the South, like during the Civil War, there are a lot of things in Gone with the Wind that are a terrible representation of a lot of people. And they're like, hey, we don't want to be putting this on a pedestal anymore. And I think that's a really great example of a band and a university standing up and be like, hey, we're going to change our traditions to like become a better school. So I hope kind of we see a similar thing from the Texas band as the story continues to unfold. 
Yeah, exactly. And like, why would you want your school's traditions to be hurtful? Right? That doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. And I definitely think it says a lot about the band um, making this decision because everyone already knows we have even less games now because of COVID and even less people are getting to go to these games. So for them to sacrifice, you know, those, you know, bittersweet, cherished moments of being at a football game because their university isn't listening, Mm -hmm. I think that's very brave of them to do. And I think a lot of people in the band world are really looking up to them and applauding them for doing this. And you know, I hope their university listens and they change it, especially since I read somewhere that um, they're they're now making all their student athletes stand um, at the end. And so I believe there's a photo now where the whole football team is standing at the end of the game since they're now being forced to. And I definitely don't think yeah, that's okay. I, I absolutely agree. I And I applaud the band members for being like, hey, we're taking a stand. We're not going to do it. Um But at the same time, the fact that the student athletes were campaigning and like telling the university like, hey, we're not comfortable with this. We don't feel like it's a good representation of us and our values. And seeing the University of Texas be like, no, like that doesn't matter to us. It just sends a really terrible message of saying like, we appreciate you for what you can do on the field for us, but like, we don't want your opinions to get involved. And that's quickly becoming a way of the past with a lot of institutions as it should. And I really hope we see that trend continue to die off and that the Texas athletes are kind of and band members are kind of able to hold their ground and push for change on a bigger level. All right. So as we've kind of talked about with the eyes of Texas and how times are really changing there, another place we've really seen advancements even in the past decade or so is about um women like the experience of women in sports and also in marching band so annabelle do you want to kind of talk about that okay so yeah one of the biggest things um so for me personally growing up i've been very blessed um with this i don't think i don't think a lot of people have had this experience but all of my head band directors throughout my entire life have always been female um which is very unusual because band is a very male-dominated sport. Um, and they've been, like, the most amazing examples of, like, women in leadership and, you know, how to take a stand and, like, really do what you believe in, you know, not to let anyone take you down mm-hmm. as it's kind of been in women in sports and women in music. Um, but as I was telling him and Savannah earlier, um, one weird experience for me was coming into college and coming into music ed um, so for choir, music ed and choir is a very female dominated area because normally it's more acceptable for women to sing. And then for instrument, instrumental wise, um, it's a very male dominated area. I remember one of my classes my sophomore year, um, it was an instrumentation class. We were learning how to play instruments and it was me and eight men learning how to play oh the flute. Oh my goodness. And it was, it was just the weirdest dynamic ever, um. Because usually I'm not the only woman in the room. And well, granted, I had an amazing teacher who was a woman. But that was very strange. Um, and there's definitely a different dynamic than my other classes. Especially flute, because flute's a more female, you know, dominated instrument. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was very interesting. But, you know, I've been very thankful for, like, the women in leadership I've had in band. Um, and then going, like, sports-wise... Um, you know, women definitely face that discrimination. And I don't know if I've ever had any, well, I guess some examples I've had. Um, so I just changed my major in the sports psychology. And so whenever I bring that up to some male friends, um, they're like, oh, you know about sports? Like, you're going to study this? And I'm like, yes, I love sports and I know mm-hmm. about them. Actually, 6 and 0 of my fantasy right now. <laughs> Flex. Like, I know, number yes. one. Um, <laughs> And so there's always that, like, awkward conversation you have to have when you want to bring up sports, usually around a man. Um, Especially, like I was saying kind of earlier with, like, pet band stuff, Mm -hmm. Um, usually women, we kind of feel scared to speak out about sports because we never know if we're going to get, like, attacked for what we say because if we think, oh, they don't actually know what they're talking about or if if you get a stat wrong, if you say something wrong, it's because you're a woman and not just because, like, you weren't paying as much, you know, attention or something exactly. like that. Like, and I know, like, Hannah, you, you were saying you had that same experience. Yes, I had, um, I've had that happen a lot. 
just any time is because I'm a digital media production major, which is kind of a male dominated major, you and I already. But then when you get into sports, I've really discovered like I'm really passionate about that. And I love working with athletics. Anytime I like say like bring up to guys like, oh, yeah, like I work in athletics. I get to work with our athletics department. It's always like, oh, well, do you cover only volleyball and like women's golf? And like there's nothing wrong with those sports. Those are great sports. But like there's automatically an assumption that because I'm a female, I couldn't possibly know about any men's sports or like understand it. It's mind boggling to me that in 2020, that's still a thing just because like women are just as capable as men at understanding sports or understanding anything. So I think really this idea that there has to be gatekeeping, like, oh, well, if you don't know this certain stat for this certain team, well, you couldn't possibly be a fan of them. Whereas like you never, if you're taught, if it's two guys talking. Oh, you're a big bandwagon. All exactly like oh you're just a bandwagon fan it's like no just because i can't name That's my like, pet peeve yes exactly it's like just because i can't name the starting lineup from the past 10 years like recite it from memory like that doesn't mean i'm not a fan and that doesn't mean i can't be a fan so i kind of mentioned this like working with athletics so i've kind of had a unique experience where i've really gotten to like be like in the mix of things and i've been so blessed to really be at you and i And I've gotten to have so many great mentors. And while my department that I work in is obviously very male dominated, like they've all been so supportive and they'll be like, yes, like go film men's basketball, go film volleyball. Like they're willing to put me into like any situation. They're like, yeah, like we believe you can do it. Go ahead and do it. So I've been really lucky. And I know for a lot of people, that's not the norm, which is sad because it really should be. And it actually wasn't until you brought it up, Annabelle, that I was thinking about it. And I actually have not had a female band director in my however many years of playing. Me neither. Yeah, until I got to college. And because I was speaking to some of the freshmen about like our different experiences. And they're, they've never even had like an assistant female one. Um, so wow. like for me, it's been definitely like, such a unique experience. Um, I know like I've never had a female band director, but... The first instance of that was one of our graduate assistants last year. Uh, shout out to Dr. Stahl at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Um, yeah, she was really cool. Loved her as my graduate assistant. But I, before that, really, I had never had a band director that was a female. Yeah, I've had, because I've had female GAs in college. I've had two. Shout out to Meredith and Fatini. They're so wonderful. Um, but I will say, I'm once again, like, even though I've had male directors, especially in college, like I've always felt like Dr. Mertz has been amazingly supportive of like, because I do a lot of media production and stuff for the band. And anytime I have a crazy idea, he's just like, yeah, go for it. I trust you. Like, um, so just being super supportive. So I'm so grateful I've had that experience. Um, I know, like, as we kind of talked about earlier, how a lot of marching band and different set and music, instrumental music in general is pretty male dominated. Um, and like as a trumpet player, uh, we don't have, we have a good deal of girls in our section, but there are usually a lot more guys. Um, but once again, like in the PNB, I've never had to feel like, oh, like I'm a girl playing trumpet. Like I don't, like I don't, I shouldn't like talk as much. I shouldn't say as, or I shouldn't play as loud. Um, we've always had like a good mix of like female and male section leaders. I feel like there's always that representation. And that's one of the things I've really loved about college band. I mean, I play the piccolo and I play flute. So, I mean, historically for me, it's been majority girls, women in our section. Um, But for me, I think most of my experience with having people kind of second guess me is what we were talking about earlier with my sports knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. Like it almost got to a point when I was younger where it was like, I need to know everything about football just to spite these people (laughs) that are telling me that I shouldn't know what I'm talking about. Like, I, I enjoy football so much, and I've had people say, oh, you actually know what you're talking about, you know? Not necessarily in college, but mostly, I think, in high school. It was more like, oh, you actually know what's going on. Like, yeah, I do. I actually enjoy and, this. And it makes you feel stupid Yeah, when exactly. people say that. Like, it's like, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, I'm allowed to like things, you know? It's been something that's been really on my mind. Being in, being in Seattle, I was talking with Annabelle and Hannah about this earlier. Being in Seattle and seeing... Um, obviously four-time WNBA champions come through, right? Amazing team. 
But, you know, it's just the little things, you know, and it's not necessarily little when it piles up like it does, but, you know, you go on the ESPN Instagram and you open the comments and it's all these, mm-hmm. you know, whether they be trolls or actually people that mean harm towards these people, you know, whatever they're saying, we don't care. Mm-hmm. My my high school varsity team could beat them any day, make me a sandwich, yeah. all these ridiculous and, and things. The fact, and the fact that there's even a separate page. Because then, like, ESPN is basically just dedicated to basically just men. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, has millions of followers. And then there's the women's page, um, which I always thought was interesting. I was like, the fact that there has to be another page, that way it's even yeah, more that's, separated. That's a really good point. Like, that's something I've never considered where it's like, why can't it just all be together? There shouldn't be so much of an attempt to divide and kind of shuffle the women off to another platform because, like, they deserve just as much respect for what they do, even if they're doing it in different sports. A lot of times women don't, I guess, achieve the same amount of respect despite doing the same things as men or even doing more than men. Like, Savannah, you mentioned earlier before we started how uh, while in the WNBA their games are shorter, but if you look at their stats, they're still busting out the same stats as men are in even less time. So if anything, that's more impressive. Um, if you're if you're gonna sit here and tell me, you know, so and so Sue Bird's stats aren't even close to LeBron James' stats, she's not the goat, or whatever you're gonna post on Instagram behind your screen, then at least mm-hmm. like acknowledge that she's great at what she does. You know, there may be differences in the rules, but she's still amazing, and you know, you can praise both LeBron James and Sue Bird at the same time. Like they're both awesome. Right. They're both doing great. And, like. You could have, like, those aren't conflicting v- viewpoints. So kind of how we were talking about, like, the, you know, the women's soccer team. Um, I was telling them earlier that Netflix now has a really good show. It's called The Playbook. And at the very end of the season, it highlights two women coaches. Um, and one of them is Dawn Staley, who is a black um, female coach. And then, and then the other one is Jill... Ellis, who is a white LGBTQ member, um, soccer coach, and they talk about not only their experience of, you know, and especially like competitive soccer that is so huge globally, Mm -hmm. um, especially men's soccer, you know, every, almost, you know, all the countries have a men's soccer team. It's one of like the biggest sports globally. And then how that was for her, um, coming into that position as a female, but then also having to come out to her team. And, you know, the world as um, a lesbian. And then Don Staley, who is the North Carolina coach. Um, I respect her so much, even though she is kind of a rival for Mizzou. <laughs> um, what she was able to do, like, just with the attendance-wise. Um, and if anyone listening has never been to a women's basketball game, please go. go. The attendance between women's basketball and men's basketball is astounding. Mm-hmm. Normally, so I'm in pet band. And the men's basketball, depending on the season, um, it's usually, you know, basically almost always full. And then women's games, it's basically just the pet Mm -hmm. band, which it shouldn't be at all, especially if the women's are having a better season. But it's just that, like, underlying discrepancy between them. That's something I've seen at you and I. Like, it makes me sad and also, like, angry on behalf of these female athletes at all levels of sports who are working so hard and accomplishing amazing things but aren't receiving the same level of support for it. So absolutely what Annabelle said, like, if you have the opportunity to go to, like, a women's basketball game, like, volleyball, like, anything, like, go. Go support. It's an awesome experience. But I think it's really important to talk about the differences in college athletes, their careers between, like, women and men because you think about all these one and done men's basketball athletes okay they they go to a really high profile school and then they dash to the NBA get this big contract get paid millions of dollars maybe not that much of right away but like a lot of money right but then you look at women's athletes who tend to not do one and done they tend to stay where they're at because like I like to think like what is the incentive for them to leave early because there's just mm-hmm. not there's just barely any money in the WNBA and it's all, it's just this one big problem, right? Because like, why isn't there money in the WNBA? Why don't we have access to watching the WNBA games on prime time? Mm-hmm. It's because channels and sponsors won't invest money 
into advertising and won't invest money into the screen time. And it's just this whole question, like, like why? Like, you have this amazing athlete out of Oregon, Sabrina Ionescu, put up record, a record-breaking season. And you had people saying, oh, well, if she would have been a one-and-done, she wouldn't have put up these stats. Or any good men's basketball player would have done this if they stayed all four years. But, like, mm-hmm. what, what's the incentive to, to leave? You know, why wouldn't you keep playing for your team and get a degree while you're at it? You know? That's just something I think about a lot. So I think that's a really great point because, like, we see that over and over and over again in the on the men's side of things. So, and until I think there's really a push, like, of, like, retailers being like, hey, we want to market during these times. We want to, and there's a push, like, let's get these into TV slots. Like, it's going to remain a problem. And it's obviously, like, looking at America, like, it's kind of a cultural issue where it's like, oh, well, only men's sports matter. So... Until that mindset starts to shift, we're not going to see meaningful change. So that's why it's so important for people to be like watching women's sports, like buy merch, like do what you can to support these teams to help them Mm -hmm. build momentum to get more attention. Yeah. And then like the very least thing you can do is go give the WNBA Mm -hmm. follow on Instagram. You know, like that's bare minimum, you know, follow their platforms, like their posts, you know. Um, even if you can't watch all of their games, like the more fans they have, the more revenue exactly. that they can get. And then they can use that money to pay their players and also put that back into their community. Um, you know, mm-hmm. like the NBA and the double NBA and all those professional sports, they're huge into like giving, you know, that back. Mm-hmm. But definitely something I've noticed that I've always taken note um, is whenever we play a team, um, that's a women's team, I always look to see if their head coach is female or male. Because I, I don't think that's something that's talked about a lot is it's interesting how in all these women-dominated sports, the majority of their coaches are male. And it's not, you know, anything like male coaches are great too, but I think that also comes from a lot of like women, they're just like being oppressed and they don't get to go to the WNBA or they don't get this experience mm-hmm. and they also don't get paid as much. Um, so a lot of women just don't have the experience to coach on a high level as much mm-hmm. as men do. And I definitely think just within the NCAA, I, I don't know the statistics, but I've noticed over time that there's there's an overwhelming male coach rate compared to women. Because mm-hmm. when has anyone ever seen a woman coach a men's basketball team? Exactly. I've, I've never seen one or a woman coach anything that's men's related and been, been mm-hmm. in the head position. So it's once again that like – giving like I because there are women there who want to do it like there's not it's not like oh what do you know like no women want to coach sports like it's not that it's that a lot of times it's like oh well what could a woman know about coaching men's basketball or coaching football stuff like that where it's once again like a an ingrained problem that more institutions like need to step up and be like hey like we need to make sure like we're looking at people of different genders, of different orientations, of different races, like really branching out and like in being intentional about looking for more diverse candidates. Yeah, and then there's like the kind of flip side of it, what we were talking about earlier with second guessing ourselves. Maybe some people are convincing themselves that they aren't qualified for the position, right? So they might not even try for the position. Exactly. You know? So there's there's a couple different facets mm-hmm. to that. Yeah, especially, like, on the disparities between, like, attractiveness, too, for women in sports. It's like, Mm -hmm. oh, you know, to get a microphone, you know, you need to fit this model, you know, of what we think, Mm -hmm. you know, is camera ready, um, you know, or just to have, like, a say in it. Or it's, oh, you're too pretty, you're dumb, you don't Mm -hmm. know what you're talking about, you know. Exactly. So I think that's definitely been interesting to look at over the years on how that's – and I definitely do think it is changing – but there is still mm-hmm. a lot to be worked on with that. Yeah, exactly. It's like if a, like a woman just isn't her looks, you know? Exactly. So, yeah, guys, that's kind of where we're at is really looking at different ways you can support women in sports and be aware of different ways that you can be helping. And now after our quick little break, we're going to get to sit down and chat with Michigan drum major from the past two years, Kelly Bertoni. And we'll see you in a bit for that. All right, guys. 
guys, welcome back. And we're gonna get started today with kind of our feature stories. Today we have Kelly Bertoni, who was the drum major for the Michigan Marching Band for two years. So Kelly, can you tell us a little bit about yourself so our viewers can kind of get to know you? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first off, thank you so much for having me here. Um, and a little bit about myself. So um, I was a member of the Michigan Marching Band for four years in my undergrad. I played the clarinet or the stick as we call them in the MMB um, for my freshman and my sophomore year. And then my junior and senior year, I had the honor and privilege of serving as the 55th drum major of the Michigan Marching Band. And then um, graduated last year. So where I'm at right now, I am actually a master's student back at the University of Michigan, studying at the School of Social Work with a management and leadership pathway. So kind of, I know you mentioned, obviously, you were a stick as when you went into the Michigan Marching Band, and it sounds like you became drum major as a junior. What was kind of your experience like in the MMB, I guess, both as a stick player and then as a drum major? Yeah, um, I, you know, definitely being a member of the marching band community, I think it's easy um, on a large campus to kind of, you know, feel like lost at times, I think. And so when you can find a community and then in a space that feels like family and home, uh, you know, that helps to make that campus smaller. And I definitely found that through the marching band. Um, they're definitely my family, um, where I met my closest friends. Um, so definitely very grateful and blessed to have had that my freshman year coming into, uh, you know, college and that entire experience. Um, and so, yeah, I definitely, I loved playing the clarinet, um, but I think uh, I had served as drum major in high school and um, I'd gone to a few camps and just, I grew up in Chelsea, Michigan. So about 20 minutes outside of Ann Arbor, uh, grew up watching the marching band. And so it was kind of always a dream to be a member of the marching band. And then um, just, you know, dreaming of a uh, drum major and, uh, you know, I, I say it often, but I truly had the opportunity to live out that dream, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, but yeah, the audition process, you know, you have to kind of start early on in the season. So I started that audition process technically um, the beginning of my sophomore year, reaching out to the drum major at the time, uh, Kevin Zhang, and um, asking for help with him training a little bit. And then, um, yeah, from there, uh, putting in the training time and then, um, yes, beginning to serve as drum major my junior year, re-auditioning for my senior year and then having that opportunity again. So what, like, why would you, why did you want to be a drum major? Like what pushed you into that dream? Yeah, um, you know, I think that, because I had such a positive experience in high school and I really saw that as a way to give back um, to just a community and a group of people that really uplift you and, you know, become your support network and, you know, your family and just having that opportunity as a way to give back. Um, and I think too, you know, you look at it as a way of interacting with your peers, but also giving back to, you know, the staff. Um, and just trying to, you know, help them create and cultivate that, um, you know, welcoming environment for more people to have that opportunity that you did. Um, so, you know, I think that's definitely the highlight of, you know, any band season, I think, is that band week or when the initial or new members join and just um, having, you know, that experience as a freshman or a new member if you join as a sophomore junior senior whatever it may be um but just you know doing what you can to try and make that experience um as memorable and enjoyable as possible so i definitely would say those were definitely some of the highlights of my junior and senior year just helping um with that experience because you know when you look at man like i'm here and i you know, have the friends that I do, and I've met the wonderful people that I have, and, you know, I've had the opportunity to perform and continue my love for music because of this organization, and so being able to give back in that way is definitely rewarding and meaningful, <laughs> as I'm sure both of you can attest to as well. I mean, 
<laughs> no marching band. That's why we exactly. do what we do, I feel like. Exactly. The band always wins. <laughs> um, so kind of along mm-hmm. those lines, because so I know it varies from conference to conference, what did your kind of d- duties as drum major kind of entail? Yeah, so um, I know a lot of marching bands, their drum major will do some conducting component. Um, at the Michigan marching band, we actually don't do that. Um, and so it's a little bit more of the performance aspect with pregame and then actually being on the field for halftime as well. Um, so pregame um, for the MMB drum major, uh, you know, kind of includes the iconic back bend, um, then doing the goalpost toss, the strut, um, being a part of that kind of performance aspect for pregame. And then with halftime, um, you're out there on the field as well. Uh, giving tempos and twirling. So twirling was something that was new for me. I never had any experience with that, but um, definitely a fun aspect of the performance for halftime. Um, So that's kind of what you see on a game day. But um, behind the scenes, a lot of it is instructional for band week. So teaching marching fundamentals to all of the new members of the band. And then, you know, as the returners, join again during band week. So just kind of instructional for band week, um, engaging with alumni and donors um, and, you know, fans, uh, just trying to really hype up the crowd, be a part of that game day experience, but also just throughout the week, you know, if people come in uh, to watch rehearsals, um, just really being welcoming. Um, and that definitely, I, I'm a people person. I love meeting people and just, um, you know, it's always such a pleasure to meet people when they come to rehearsals to watch. Um, and yeah, so I, I think that's a lot of kind of the behind the scenes. Um, but then what you see on the field is a little bit more of the performance aspect. The big house is like, what, 100,000 plus people? Yes. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure as I'm sure as like a Michigan marching band member, you have like that moment where you like maybe first pregame for me it was my first pregame. But like when you have like a first time on the field, like as a band member and you have that like moment of like, like, <laughs> oh, my God, like this is real. Like I'm actually here. Can, like, did you have that experience? And like, did you have it twice because as a band member and then as like a drum major? Yeah, I, you know, um, Definitely can relate with you there, Jason. I think that it's really special when, um, you know, you can kind of, I I don't know that you ever fully wrap your head around it because it's just so exciting every time you're a part of that game day experience and performing. But um, the Michigan Marching Band has a really neat tradition. We call it Night of the Wolverine, um, where during our band week, um, I hope, no future Michigan marching band members are listening because this gives away the surprise. But anyways, um, so we have Night of the Wolverine and that's where um, all of the returning members um, kind of get dismissed from the rehearsal early and they go into the stands of the big house um, and all of the student leaders and the new members stay behind on our rehearsal field. And we kind of have the opportunity to talk about band week, how it's going. Student leaders share their experiences um, throughout marching band. And then they kind of go on, you know, a a walk over to the big house and have the opportunity to run down the tunnel for the first time. And all of the returning members are in the stands and they're playing their instruments. They play the fight song, the victors, and you run out onto the field and it's late at night, all of the lights are on for you. And just, I remember my freshman year that actually happened on my birthday. Um, during the band greatest week. birthday present. Honestly, it was. <laughs> There's, you know, I don't know that there will ever be one to top it because it was just such an exciting moment. Um, and just, you know, I remember crying and just um, truly feeling that like, wow, like, please someone pinch me. Am I dreaming? Like, this is crazy. Um, so definitely having that moment. And then um, you're right, though, Jason, you know, like sometimes when there's like the crowd aspect too. I, I think I definitely had that um, when performing um, for the first time uh, for a pregame. Uh, you know, there's there's nothing really like hearing all of the crowd around you and just like, whoa, like, just got to remember what you practice, like, just stay focused, because it can be a lot for sure. But yeah. 
That's awesome. That's like, such a oh, cute God. tradition. I love a... that. <laughs> yeah. But can you, since you're a grad or grad assistant for the Michigan marching band, can you tell me a little bit about like what you guys have been doing kind of during COVID and how you guys have all been staying connected? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as a graduate student instructor, I work, um, there are five of us. Um, so some are conducting students actually through the School of Music, Theater and Dance, and then others, um, myself and actually two others that are new this year, um, we were all in the MMB as well. So coming back and serving in this way has been amazing. But um, we all kind of are, again, part of that instructional component. Um, so it can be helping to set up um, rehearsals, take down rehearsals, um, just helping with a lot of the logistical things. So, um, you know, it's oftentimes like helping with rehearsals, but then, you know, being ready for that game day. So um, water bottles, snacks, all organized. Um, you know, just logistically what different students need, uh, meeting their needs. It could be even coordinating if a visiting band is coming. Um, so helping to kind of communicate with them um, or for homecoming, typically, you know, there's kind of uh, communication and just making sure that all of that is set up um, for them. So, um, and then as a GSI also, um, they are the people that you'll see um, for the MMB conducting on the sidelines. So as far as a performance aspect goes, um, so while I didn't get to do that for um, being drum major, I might have the opportunity to do that as a GSI. Um, so that's who you'll see on the ladders uh, for our performance. Oh, yeah. So then one question I kind of had, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe you were like the third female drum major in the mm -hmm. history of the band. So what did that kind of mean to you to kind of really make your mark as part of the legacy as being among the first group of female drum majors at Michigan? Yeah, um, you know, I think that uh, it's interesting. I, I think that the way that I personally view that drum major position is, you know, it doesn't matter who's wearing that uniform, um, you are just representing um, that band and um, you know, really trying to embody the spirit of that game day and just making that an enjoyable experience for everyone. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think that um, being representative of the entire student body, um, you know, and so um, very glad that we have females in the band uh, marching alongside us because that was not always the case for marching bands. Um, and so, you know, to represent in that way, but. Um, you know, I'm I'm so thankful for all of the uh, drum majors that um, came before me and kind of made that path. Um, very grateful. I know that um, just the kind of network. I mean, last week I had a call. Um, it was kind of like a little drum major reunion um, with everyone. You know, from that that we could kind of collect. But our newest uh, drum major, the 56th drum major with Walter, um, and then, you know, some uh, members who served, you know, quite a few years ago. And I think that um, just looking at that bond of drum majors um, and just, you know, how there's really that community and support network and just, you know, they'll help you learn how to twirl, they'll, they'll help you with their your marching and they'll be honest with you. They'll give you your their feedback and everything like that. So, um, yeah, definitely, you know, I, I don't, take that position for granted and I um you know I'm I'm so thankful to have had that opportunity and um you know I I I fully acknowledge I am a female and I was you know the third and I'm very grateful for that but I think that the position of drum major speaks a lot more to just who that individual is because um mm -hmm. it's not about you know, the one individual, it's about the entire MMB family or whatever band community it may be. Mm -hmm. That's so wow. cool. I, I see that. why you were picked for drum major. <laughs> <laughs> Just the naps. <laughs> That's awesome. That's such a good, like, mindset to go into it. That, like, that's just incredible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And if, if you haven't, if anyone's listening or watching and hasn't seen, like, the Take the Field Michigan episode or any of the episodes anywhere like of the two seasons i highly recommend you go watch it i know that we, especially i saw in that episode that the michigan marching band is 
is a band that marches less people than are actually in the band. Mm-hmm. And um, across the country, it, it differs through bands, obviously, but our band in particular is also one of those bands where you audition. Um, so you have to audition for it. And then there's also, like, we call them game day staff. But there are spots that are for alternates, if, basically alternates, if you will, for that game, for pregame and half. Or pregame and halftime, it's just one spot. So you can't be, like, in pregame and not in halftime. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, we have that position. So do you think, like, because I will say the Michigan March Man is really good. But do you think that, like, I don't want to call it stress, but, like, that comp- competitive likeness is part of, like, why the Michigan band is so great? You know, I think um, it's it's interesting. Yeah, we so we have challenges every uh, new show cycle. Um, so you do have to kind of uh, audition for your spot. Um, so at the beginning of the entire season, we do have a chair placement audition. Um, so that's kind of where you get your chair assignment. Um, so that's taken into consideration as well as your marching challenge. So there's a um, halftime uh, component. So, you know, we have our, you know, same drill that we march out with a new, uh, you know, uh, arrangement of music and then a pregame portion that's the same every time. And, you know, I I do think that it does, um, it makes people, you know, want to practice uh, put in that time outside of just the regular band hours um, that you're, you know, kind of rehearsing. Um, I, you know, I think it's a good uh, system to have in place. It's worked well um, for the MMB, but, you know, having said that, you know, as we've sat here today, Hannah and Jason, I think, you know, every band program is different and things will work differently. Um, I think uh, the mentality is, you know, that, you know, you're, it's a competitive, um, you know, ensemble where, you know, once you audition and you're in the ensemble, you're in, you know, you're in for your entire, um, you know, college experience, but um, then kind of that field component is where you can kind of, um, you know, audition and and work towards it, um, kind of setting that mindset that nothing should ever be taken for granted. Um, You kind of have to work hard and earn it. I think, um, and you know, it's it's tough because oftentimes, you know, Jason, you were talking about how you know the mellows have like their traditions um, and kind of things that they do, and often you get really close with the people in your section, but then you're also auditioning against them, right? You're challenging against them for a spot on the field, um, so it can be tricky sometimes, for sure. But um, uh, in my experience, I've seen that as a really great growing opportunity for a lot of people to, you know, stay after rehearsal and give marching feedback and pointers and say, yeah, like, I'll record you and, you know, while you do a rep, if you can help me out on this next rep. And, you know, just kind of doing that to build one another up and help in that skill level, I think is really what it's come to. Um, so, but yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, like I said, I think every band program is different. Um, and I think there have been conversations, you know, depending on who you ask, probably in the ensemble, they'll tell you different things. But um, I think it's a pretty good policy. Yeah, I think that's a really neat way to look at it, too, is that it's not so much of competing with people, but pushing each other to really do your best. And I mm-hmm. think that's really neat. Um, I know, like me personally, like, our ensemble is an audition. Um, in fact, when I was watching the Take the Field and like hearing about auditioning for every show, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I am terrible at auditions. So I, I'm very happy we don't do that, but it's really cool to see how it's really pushed the MMB and so many other ensembles to like another level. So I think that's really neat. So. Yeah, no, and absolutely. Cause I think that what you just said, Hannah, I, I think, it's really important to acknowledge that some people like I'm not good with auditions. You know, I, I don't like doing that. Like, um, but I I think that they try and take that into consideration with Mm -hmm. making it a chair um, audition, you know, at the beginning where that is, you know, you walk into a room, they can't see who's playing. um, So it's an anonymous in uh, that way. Um, And so, you know, just trying to definitely navigate that situation and knowing that, you know, some people like for challenges, like, oh my gosh, I I would get really nervous 
for the drum major process, you have to audition in front of all of your band members um, and it comes down to a vote. So, you know, I like, I get that, um, you know, and I think that's important to recognize that um, each individual, you know, kind of uh, has their different needs, you know, when it comes to auditioning um, and things like that. Um, my freshman year, I only made two games. Um, but I think that definitely motivated me to want to put in that time to practice um, and really improve my marching. And um, I definitely worked to get past that mindset of like, it's okay, I'm just challenging again, like every other week, it's gonna be the same and it's gonna be okay, so. Yeah. All right, well, Kelly, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Um, it was great to get to chat with you. Oh, thank you both so much. I really enjoyed this. All right, guys, and I'll have you stick around because right after this, we will be getting into our picks for football for next week. So stay tuned. All right, so welcome back, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get into our college football matchups for week nine. Um, so the first episode or the first match we're going to talk about um, is going to be Number three, Ohio State at number 18, Penn State. Let's start with Craig. What do you think? Uh, okay. Penn State is going to be mad that they lost in that very close game. Um, I think this week, James Franklin, Coach Franklin, is going to really work them hard. And I think they're going to kind of come back with a vengeance. Uh, and the Ohio State team, although they're good, they didn't look as good as they've been in the past. Um, they didn't look as, you know, as much of leagues ahead of where the, uh, as like where they have been compared to the rest of the conference in the past. I think it's going to be a close one. Um, and I think Penn State might be able to pull it off. I, I think I'm going to pick Penn State, but also I don't like to pick Penn State. I'm going to pick Ohio State on this one. <laughs> <laughs> in a stunning reversal. <laughs> I know. I, I, as I was saying that, I realized I will never pick Penn State again. All right. <clears throat> on to Savannah. Who do you have? I'm going to pick Ohio State. Um, I think their defense is kind of lacking this year, uh, but I don't think Penn State is going to be able to capitalize, so I think Ohio State's going to take it. All right. Another for Ohio State. Alex, who have you got? Uh, so first off, shout out to Hannah for taking over the pick segment this week because she's already doing a great job and I'm really excited for it. Penn State sucks and never, ever pick Penn State. So even though I dislike Ohio State a lot, I'm still going with Ohio State. Alex, you pronounced IU wrong. <laughs> Annabelle, who have you got? I'm going to go with Ohio State. It's Jason. Jason, who have you got this week? <laughs> yeah, um... So last week, I watched the Ohio State game versus Nebraska, and I said before, don't sleep on a Adrian Martinez and um, Luke McCaffrey. Also, very both very good. Um, just because they're very good doesn't mean Ohio State like is bad. Like they had they had a hard time against them, but they're good players. So I'm not gonna like knock on Ohio State for that. Um, Penn State, I think I agree with Craig. They are gonna come back with a vengeance. Um, but I just don't think they can beat Ohio State and Justin Fields, so I'm going with Ohio State. That brings it to me. So here's the thing is we were actually, we were supposed to perform, I believe we were supposed to perform with the Ohio State band this year at BOA Grand Nats, so a little sad I didn't get to see them in person. But that being said, it is against the laws of all good things good and holy as a Michigan fan to pick Ohio State in anything for any reason. And for that reason, I am going with Penn State this Ooh. week. Okay, okay, so that's a loss for Hannah, guys. Penn Go State. Cats, question mark? <laughs> Go going Cats. Uh, for, no, for no reason at all, I'm just going to go with Go Cats there. Our next matchup is going to be number 17, Indiana, at Rutgers. And for those of you that didn't catch the game last week, Rutgers beat Michigan State. Uh, <laughs> Craig is vibing with that. That's is thrilling. I think the whole team was excited to see that happen. Um, so <laughs> I don't think we need to ask Craig who he's rooting for this week, but Craig, do us the honor <laughs> of telling us anyway. So I'm very conflicted in this pick. Um, <laughs> because on the... On, on the one hand, I always want to support my team. But also, <laughs> what is that? But also, 
Um, so <laughs> Coach Ciano, this is his second game and his second stint at Rutgers. But currently, his record as head coach at Rutgers is 69 and 67. So if we lose our next two games, including this week, this coming week against Indiana and next week against Ohio State, 69-69. <laughs> Is it worth nice. the meme? Nice. <laughs> nice. Or is it worth, you know, having the uh, the win? Personally, publicly, I'll say it's worth getting the win. Um, I'll keep my private opinions to myself. <laughs> All right. Annabelle, who do you have this week? I, no, I'm going to go with they're, Indiana. You know, <laughs> I do support Craig and his team. Um, but I'm going to go with Indiana. They don't even have a drum. <laughs> all right. Once again, we're going to ask Jason for his pick, but I think once again, we all know what it's going to be. A tie. <laughs> I will say that I was very impressed with that quarterback from Indiana. Um, honestly, props to him. Put the game on his shoulders twice. Pulled through. Very impressed. Very worried about our game against them. But I am going to take Rutgers for the sole reason that IU still sucks. <laughs> Savannah, who have you got? Uh, I'm going to pick Rutgers just because I want them to win. Like, I want Rutgers in the playoff. <laughs> 2020 college football playoff. <laughs> you know, why not? Playoff Rutgers down. taking on Clemson. <laughs> Rutgers versus Mizzou. <laughs> so the Rutgers, real bottom yeah. for the basement right there. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, who have you got this week? Rutgers has won the national championship. <laughs> Right, right. Rutgers. That's my pick. <laughs> I personally, I'm also going to go with Rutgers because I love an upset. I love an underdog team. And I would love to see Rutgers become the unsung hero of the Big Ten this year. <laughs> so heading over to the Big 12, we have number 24 Oklahoma at Texas Tech. And we're going to start with Savannah for this one. Oklahoma hasn't been great this year, but neither has Texas Tech. And I think since Oklahoma is kind of still in the rankings, I'm going to I'm gonna go with Oklahoma. They might have a better shot. Craig, who have you got? Um, I think, I mean, I agree with Savannah. I think Oklahoma's ranked. My picks have not been good this season so far. So I'm just going to go with Savannah. Sure, we'll, we'll go with Oklahoma. Last time you did that, it did not end up well for us, though. <laughs> so I'm kind of worried. <laughs> That's Savannah. I believe Craig specifically said, I'm going with Iowa State, but when I pick teams, they usually lose, and Iowa State did lose last weekend. So, coincidence? Perhaps? Perhaps. Or are the coaches all conspiring against me? Alex, who have you got this week? Um, I don't like Oklahoma. Like, I, This isn't going to be the game that I think a lot of people think it's going to be, and I'm going to go with Texas Tech because they might need that signature win. But, I mean, Oklahoma's not as good as people think this year. That's all I'm going to say. Annabelle, who have you got? So I would pick Texas Tech if they were against somebody else because when Patrick, Patrick Mahomes went there, <laughs> one of my favorite cheerleaders went there, so you know, of course. Um, but I am going to go with Oklahoma. Even though their records are pretty close, Oklahoma is 3-2 to two and Texas Tech is 2-3. to three, But I do think Oklahoma is going to win. So all right, Jason. I am actually going to take the upset on this one, and I'm going to go with Texas Tech. To quote, to, It's just a feeling, to quote Savannah. It's just it's just a gut feeling. Yeah, you know, I'm also – see, I don't – I really like Oklahoma's gymnastics program, but I'm going to go with Texas Tech just to no. spice things up a little bit. So now we've got number 16, Kansas State at West Virginia back in the Big 12. So let's go with uh, – we're going to go with Jason. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm, again, hopefully this doesn't fail me, but I'm going to take the upset on this one and go with West Virginia. So please don't let me down, Mountaineers. All right, Savannah. Honestly, I don't know. Uh, I'll pick Kansas State. They're purple. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Alex. Um... Oh, man, this is going to be tough. I don't know. Kansas State seems a fluky 16, so the, I think the game will be close, but I'm going to give Kansas State the edge here. Annabelle. Okay, I'm going to pick West Virginia for a couple reasons. One, because they're black and gold. Two, because they beat Kansas by, like, 20 points. Um, what, Jason? Uh, Kansas Kansas isn't West Virginia yeah, blue and gold? Blue. Uh, well, I, they're gold, though. That's what I mean. <laughs> they're gold, so go gold. 
um, I don't remember my mom, but three, they were really <laughs> close to beating Texas Tech. And then four, anything in Kansas I don't like. So I can't Valid. root for Kansas State. Good point. <laughs> Craig. All right. So I frankly don't know enough about either program to have to have enough of an opinion. But there was a friend of mine from high school, from my high school band, is in the uh, the West Virginia band. So we'll we'll go with West Virginia on this one. Country roads, take me home to the place <laughs> where I belong. I'm going with West Virginia just because of that song. And that place right. that you belong is the national championship. Yeah, you know what? You're right. On the uh, top of the later Rutgers, West Virginia for the national championship. <laughs> I would live for that kind of chaos. Um, all right, so then we're going to get to number 20, Coastal Carolina at Georgia State. Yeah. Her face says it all. <laughs> the <Chelsea> clears. <laughs> Woo! Uh, we'll start with Alex because he seems pretty amped oh, up. Oh, I'm so time. hyped for this game. Oh, the Chanticleers with the teal turf. Oh, they're making a vengeance as a group of five. I mean, they're making it in. They're playing with a vengeance as a group of five team. Craig, let's go to you. Who have you got? Um, let's go with Georgia State. Savannah. <laughs> Savannah, who have you got? Uh, I'm just going to say what I usually say when I don't know what I'm talking about, which is I'm going to go with my gut and say <laughs> Coastal Carolina is going to win this week. <laughs> Jason. I guess I got to go with the Chanticleers. <laughs> Such a cool name. <laughs> Annabelle. Um, I'm going to go with Coastal Carolina just because I like their colors, and I think their field is bold, so I stand <laughs> with it. I don't know anything about either of these teams. Um, <laughs> Coastal's ranked. Just go with your gut. Too. Yeah, I'll go with Coastal Carolina. That sounds pretty. I bet it's probably a very pretty campus by the coast. So our here's our second to last pick today. We've got Purdue at Illinois. We're taking our cannon back. That's all you need to know. Cannon. All right, Jason's got Purdue. Uh, Craig, who have you got? Um, I'm gonna pick Purdue. Thanks, Savannah. Craig. Who have you got? I'll pick Purdue as well. Alex, who have you got? Uh, I'm sorry, Jason. I'm going with Lovey oh. Smith, no. Illinois. What? <laughs> I wouldn't go with Lovey Smith. All right, Annabelle. <laughs> um. So even though, so last year um, for basketball, I got to meet the Illinois band, and they were really cool. Um, but I am going to go with Purdue. Um, even though they don't have the biggest drum, they're black and gold. Black and gold, baby. <laughs> Roll train. I'm going to go with Purdue. Choo-choo. Uh, hammer up, a lion eye down. <laughs> Question mark? I don't know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> She's trying. All right, everybody. Well, that wraps up our pick segment for this week. So thank you so much for joining us. Make sure to give us a follow on Twitter at College Band RDO, Instagram at College Band Radio, and on YouTube, hit that subscribe button for College Band Radio. So until next week, stay safe, stay healthy, wear a mask, and you'll hear from us soon. <laughs>